important uh, uh, meeting on building the capacity to decolonize uh, through the role of uh, futures uh, literacy. We're very excited as the VETS School of Governance to be to be hosting this event uh, and to be welcoming you, welcoming you uh, to, to this event. We, uh, as a school, as a graduate school uh, that uh, has an interface uh, to public policy and, and governance, we always want to push ourselves for relevance uh, to generate uh, policy insights uh, and knowledge uh, that can be used uh, not only by policymakers but also uh, other uh, key decision makers in society as well as uh, civic uh, participants or civic civic leaders. Uh, so the, the this meeting today, um, and, and I just want to um, uh, acknowledge uh, the, the support uh, that we uh, that that we've um, received from our Canadian partners, IDRC, uh, and I also acknowledge uh, UNESCO uh, and and various participants uh, from around the African continent, and and the rest and the rest of of the world. Um, the theme dovetails to uh, to our interests because it's essentially about building resilience for an unknown future. Uh, futures literacy, something that we don't talk about uh, a lot, and, and I think something that is uh, uh, even more relevant uh, in a time of crisis, in a time of, of pandemic, uh, to start to imagine uh, different futures, uh, to, uh, to, to start um, uh, thinking about ways of, of living uh, and governing uh, in, in a future that we don't have uh, a direct, direct control over today. Uh, so I am personally looking forward uh, to uh, to the discussions today and I, I hope you don't mind I'm going to stay uh, a little longer than I was asked to stay because I, I do want to learn uh, from the different colleagues uh, and experts uh, that have done some in-depth work uh, on, on this theme. With, with those words with those words I, I, I would like to to really uh, uh, welcome you to, to this event. I hope you feel welcome, even though you, we are all online. And, and back to you, uh, Geshi. Thank you, Mzu. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Actually, I think we'll hand straight over to Avi and Yannick. Yannick, maybe yourself? Yes. Thank you, thank you, Geshe. Yeah, thank you for the really warm words and welcoming words to, to the head of school. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here and to share this space. I will hand over to, to Evi from IDRC. Uh, and after heavy welcoming words, uh, we will discuss the agenda for today together. Thank you, Evi. Thank you, Yannick, and thank you, Professor. Uh, I don't seem to be able to restart my video, uh, so I, I'll just speak without it. Um, I'm very pleased to also welcome everyone today on behalf of Canada's International Development Research Center, or IDRC. Um, IDRC funds and supports locally led research in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. And we do this in the belief that researchers in both the natural and social sciences have an important and powerful role to play in shaping their own societies. And over the last few years, IDRC has started to take an interest in the role foresight and future studies can play both in our own choices as an institution and in the countries in which we work. So we were very pleased to be able to support last year some exciting thinking and exchanges in this area, which you'll hear about today. And uh, now I promised our organizers I wouldn't speak for more than about a minute. So let me just say that I'm as eager as all of you to hear the latest on this work and where it might be going. And of course, I'm so pleased at the interest that it's generating. I see more than 80 participants on the call already. Uh, so with another warm welcome to all of you, I'll hand things back to Yannick. So, thanks so much, Harry. Uh, yes, it's, re it's really a big pleasure to, to share this space with all of you to, uh, today. And yeah, sure, it's a virtual space, it's, it's, we are only online. But uh, in the last months or even years, I realized that when, when we discuss and speak about uh, topics related to future literacies, uh, 
uh, imagination, decoloniality, it's always somehow transcendental. So I hope that this transcendentality will, uh, will help us uh, to transcend uh, the, the, the barriers of the virtual space. So and I would really like to, to start by extending my gratitude to, uh, to all the participants. I see 86 people uh, in the Zoom right now. And we also have, uh, we are live on Facebook. And uh, I guess we also have a recording for YouTube. So uh, yeah, thank you everyone for, for joining us, for joining this, this discussion. Yes. Um, uh, I have, I don't have that much uh, rules to share for the discussion. I guess nowadays we are mostly used to Zoom and other uh, video conferencing tools. So I will just um, gently uh, ask you to mute yourself if you are not uh, speaking. And yeah, and also to interact in the chat. So really, really uh, do that. If you have any questions, any comments, any observation, any random thoughts, whatever across uh, uh, your mind, please just share and, you, and something that you want to share with us, please just do that. And, and, share, and we will also have the time for this to, to discuss. So, and that, that brings me to the agenda. So the, the discussion, uh, is designed in two slots. So in the first slot, we will have some uh, quick introduction to to the project, the capacity to decolonize. Uh, so Gishi will will, will uh, give us the, the the main elements of the project. What is it and why we, we believe that we 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 should do that. Uh, and Renmila from UNESCO will will give us the, the the theoretical foundation of what we are doing. And this will be followed by uh, some some an illustration, a practical illustration of what we can do with the capacity to decolonize. So, and at the end of the first lot, we'll have uh, some two in, two presentation about the practicalities of the project. So that's the first slot. Uh, and the second slot of the of the event is reserved for the discussion. So, so the first part is more or less planned. So the first 15 minutes are planned, but for the second part, the most important plan, we don't have that much plan. On the agenda, we just have lively discussion. So you see, we believe in emergence, right? So the first part is planned. The second most important part is more or less open, or is really open. So and this, so we are, we are basically betting that we'll have a, a lively discussion, a fruitful discussion about the topic we shall bring us, bring us to, to, together today. So I will not really introduce the speakers and, and, and their biography uh, because I believe that the best introduction we can get is what they will share with us today. So on my side, I'm Yannick Kemayu, uh, and it's really a pleasure and an honor to, to facilitate this dialogue today. I am uh, uh, the founder of Kabaku Academies, uh, and we and, and my interest and our interest in the capacity to decolonize is that we are we're experimenting about how a learning organization, an educational organization, uh, which brings together high tech and local knowledge and indigenous knowledge in Africa might look like uh, today and, and in the future. So um, that's been said, please again, interact in the chat. I see now we are almost 100 people here, so it's really great. So please, uh, you can, you can, you really, really uh, welcome to interact in the chat or for those following on Facebook. You can also uh, uh, interact by commenting the video and we will, uh, and if you have questions, we'll make sure that uh, 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 the panelists might address your questions. So um, maybe just one, uh, one last thing. Uh, before uh, giving the, the, the floor to, to Geshe. Uh, we are probably familiar, most of us are familiar with the call and responses uh, uh, pattern, uh, that which, has, which are most of the time used in traditional uh, African context. So myself, I was born and raised in, uh, in what is called Cameroon, so in Central Africa. Uh, and in, in some part uh, uh, of, 
in the region, at least in the region where, where I was raised up, when when we went to discuss uh, uh, and the the host basically need to have the uh, the uh, The, I, I need the authorization, basically. I need your authorization to make sure that I that I have uh, the, you know, that that I, I can uh, facilitate this dialogue, and it's basically current response. So I don't know. This is an experiment. So uh, maybe we have like uh, we have ninety three people. We will we will try it. So uh, I will I will call. I will, I will do a call and I hope that some people will respond. You can also respond by the chat. So because I will also write it in the chat. So basically, I need to say a wula wula. And if you are with me, and if you uh, if you want to engage in the discussion, you just need to respond wula. So I say a wula wula. And to, if you are ready to engage and you want us to engage, you say wula. Let me just write it in the chat. So. Uh, okay, so I see someone always you wait. A wula wula, a wula. Great, 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 great. So, a wula wula. Wula wula. Super, so nice, ula. nice. So, we can engage, we can engage. Great, great, great. So, Gigi, I guess we are ready for you. Thank you, and thank you for making sure we had a live audience uh, and a willing one. So, so, thank you to everybody for being here. Uh, I'm Geshi Karuri Sabina, uh, sitting in Johannesburg. Uh, you can see my university behind there. I am uh, a visiting research fellow at uh, the Witz School of Governance. Uh, very excited to be here today among colleagues, some of whom uh, we've been on this, uh, we call it C2D, Capacity to Decolonize, journey with. Uh, and then many of you from all over the world, it looks like, uh, who are interested in engaging. So, so that's, that, that's really great. Um, my job is actually a little bit brief. Uh, I will introduce the C2D project and, and how we got to today, uh, and then uh, just hand back so that other colleagues can get into the meat of it, uh, what we're really here for. So, so, so C2D is a, a product of uh, a journey we've been on, uh, uh, those of us who are uh, on the team in front of you for some time now, uh, and, and, and the origins in some ways date back to around 2013 when there were a series of African Futures Forums that were started. Uh, there was a first one in Paris, which was around imagining Africa's future. It was subtitled Beyond Models of Catch-Up and Convergence. Uh, it was followed up actually in 2014 here at the Witz School of Governance uh, with a session that we called Decolonizing African Futures, Exploring and Realigning Alternative Systems. Uh, and those conversations, and you hear the language was already uh, 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 forming then, uh, was really about the space of futuring and foresight, which a number of us were involved with, uh, but which was becoming in a way deeper, more critical. Uh, Real Miller, who's here with us, for some of us is a bit of a rock star because he was part of pioneering uh, uh, some, some different thinking uh, in what's now referred to as the disciplines of anticipation, uh, which culminated in a book after a series of experiments and projects in 2018 called Transforming the Future, Anticipation in the 21st Century. I think we can share a link to that, the titles there on the slide. Um, and what all of this was, was many of us beginning to contemplate uh, what the work we were doing on the continent meant, uh, but also uh, in view of how some of the thinking about anticipation itself and how we imagined what development meant and what we were trying to do uh, was affected. Uh, and of course, I kept mentioning throughout that uh, in South Africa, the language of decolonization is particularly salient and, and probably has uh, a lot more momentum than it does in many other spaces. But what this led us to do was developing a proposal to CEDA, the Swedish CEDA, uh, uh, in 2019, I believe, uh, where they were call making calls for people who are doing interesting research uh, that could perhaps help rethink learning in the humanities. And we thought that this space we were in, this exploration that we'll talk about today on what futures literacy means and how that relates to the idea of decolonizing futures uh, made for an interesting proposition. So we were unsuccessful, uh, but as many things in life are, you know, you fail with one thing, but you find another shoot somewhere else. Uh, and so we were really pleased when in engagement with the IDRC, um, there was an interest in supporting a, a deeper 
co-design process to take some of those early ideas further. So what we did, we invited 30 people internationally, mainly African, and these were futurists, these were decolonial thinkers, these were people who were activists in the space. Uh, and with that sponsorship, uh, and thank you, Avi Kaplan and your team for believing in us and, and supporting uh, uh, some crazy and provocative ideas. Um, and, and with the support of it, we were able to, to get going. Uh, I see in the participants here, I think some of the people who were involved with that process uh, were present. And thank you all for, for, for having uh, participated in that. Now, what that led to was, uh, well, we thought it was going to lead to a nice weekend at the Kruger, actually, sipping on gin and talking about decolonization. But, you know, COVID had other ideas and we ended up... Um, Again, some things good, some things bad. The good was that we ended up being able to have a bigger group. The bad was that uh, we ended up having to not meet in person. But the good is we were able to have quite a creative um, uh, design process online and to think about how we would engage to take this forward. Um, the, the website, uh, which we'll share with you, uh, uh, documents a lot of what happened over the course of May last year, uh, and that resulted in the proposition that we will talk about today, C2D, uh, as well as a background research paper that was, uh, again, um, I think some of the authors are, are with us here today, uh, which was really a literature survey and was that crucial task of beginning to survey the thinking that's happened in this space, and they're big thinkers, they're big concepts that we were engaging with here. Uh, and really trying to just get a handle on that body of literature and where we were trying to go with it as we were pushing it in, in a way combining a, a, a decolonial literature that was there uh, with these ideas of futures thinking. Uh, and some of those decolonial theorists, I think many of us, uh, particularly in South Africa, are quite familiar with. Some of them are just around the block, like Sepo Madlingozi, who's at Vitz Cows now, uh, Sabelon Glovu Gacheni at UNISA, uh, but even closer to home, people like Catherine Odora Hoppers, who are on our panel, are people who in the South African space have long been contributing on these issues. But there's really also been a very global interest and conversation, uh, and that's what we were tapping into. Um, maybe just to mention, because you know, my role there was in some ways hosted as WITS. Uh, so the WITS School of Governance has been one of the spaces in the university that, uh, well, one of several places in the university that's had a history of futures uh, and foresight educational offerings. Um, and I think it's not insignificant that uh, in a space like that, we would want to see how that inquiry could grow and extend, particularly because these issues, uh, as we keep saying uh, in our collective, are, are intellectual, but they're also real. Uh, the protests are real, the decolonial issues are real, and many of us uh, uh, face them, you know, even if it's not in our intellectual work, certainly when you step out of your office and students are protesting and are asking these questions, uh, I think it's a space we really can't uh, avoid uh, much further. So the idea for the seminar, in fact, is to share the work. Uh, we want to create awareness, just to let you all know uh, that this has been happening. We want to create connection to people who have uh, an interest uh, in the practice uh, and certainly in the intellectual pursuit and the experimentation. Uh, and of course, we also want to invite debate. Um, we've had similar conversations with some of the development partners. We are in the process of trying to generate uh, funding support to take the actual implementation forward. And Eva will tell you something about what the actual project is. Uh, but yeah, we, we welcome you today into this space, uh, uh, into a conversation we've been having about how to engage with this question of captive imaginaries and the stolen futures. So thank you, Yannick. I think I'll hand over back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keshi, for this really nice, nice introduction and, and for, for really putting all the discussion about the capacity to decolonize in the, con in the broader context and also the, the genesis of the project. Thanks so much. So, uh, well, are you ready? So, we will now have... My, uh, yes. video, my video is not starting at the moment. Okay. Good. So, but you can, do you want to start? Yeah, I can start. Oh, there yeah. you go. Start. Yeah, good. Okay, I've got it. Okay, cool. So, thanks so much, Will. Hello there. Uh, thank you to all of you. I and mean, it's, it's a wonderful feeling uh, to be here uh, with all of you. I mean, uh, I started my career at the OECD in 1982 in the economics department, where forecasting was the main way to imagine the future. Uh, and... Um, I had done my PhD work at the New School for Social Research in New York in political economy. And it was the disconnect in many ways 
between what was going on at the OECD, which I was not surprised by, but which nevertheless um, was different once you're in the thick of it, uh, experiencing it, living it, uh, and and the the kind of uh, world that was opened up by the studies that I'd done uh, at the new school uh, involving friends from around the world today. And, and I, I want to just pay re reference to Kevle Kamara, who uh, I met back then when we were doing PhD work together in New York. Uh, and today it feels very much like that voyage uh, has continued. And so I just want to uh, acquaint you, I think, a little bit with, with how this has emerged. And I'm telling my story in some ways, uh, and I wanted to speak from my experience and very aware of the limits uh, of that experience, but also uh, that potentially uh, I have something to contribute. Uh, today, uh, as I explain what futures literacy is about and really why it's relevant to the topic today uh, in the sense of uh, capacity to decolonize, is that um, the, dis the description is that, that there's a, a certain capacity um, that we all understand very well, which is our ability to speak. Um, we can, most of us, the vast majority of humans um, have the command of language, different languages, but nevertheless, we all have that capability. Um, and so it's not surprising, uh, although it's not universal, uh, that writing becomes one way of augmenting this capacity to speak. It's a, uh, it has to be a very familiar uh, pattern for humans to uh, search for tools that augment what we can do, that in some senses are part of us. Uh, and writing and obviously reading um, are one of those ways of augmenting what humans have as an innate capability. As I searched uh, in my own path, which I'll describe a little bit later on, um, to, to find a way to use my imagination more effectively, um, I came across something that, that seemed really central to me, which is that uh, if we look at uh, the work of people like uh, um, Robert Rosen and Roberto Poli and others, we get to see that um, anticipation is something that is all characteristic of all living things. It's inherent to a living organism. And that struck me as, as something really central because it meant that in effect, the study of anticipatory systems and processes was a, a, an entry point into the diversity of the ways that people use their imagination. And this, this I think, will we'll speak to, to many uh, people who are, are participating today because it's, a, it's, from my perspective, a theoretical entry point. Um, and developing that capacity um, was something that, that I felt helped me to understand what I was doing. And I was primarily, I've been primarily throughout my career, a practitioner, somebody who uh, uh, is asked by others uh, all around the world to help them think about the future. And uh, many of you have heard me, me talk about this, but one of the, the things that was most striking uh, as I started to design these processes was that on the one hand, the tools I was using were simply ones that were available. In other words, I had no real reason for picking one tool over another, a forecast over a scenario exercise over a, a Delphi process or whatever it happened to be. Um, I had no underlying theoretical reason to choose one or the other. I had practical reasons. Could I do it? <laughs> Could I use it? Um, and sometimes the clients, the, the, the people working on the future had reasons to pick one method over another, but there was no underlying theory. The other thing that I noticed very quickly, and I think it's an experience that we all have in many ways, is that it's pretty difficult actually to imagine the future. Um, and I think that, that uh, we become aware when we ask people to exercise their imagination uh, and think about the future, that the images that we're using, the, the assumptions that uh, enable us to um, describe the imaginary, because 
I probably don't need to say it, but everybody understands that the future doesn't exist. It exists only in conscious human form as what we imagine. Uh, why we imagine it, how we imagine it can be different. So that process of saying, well, where did my image of the future come from? What, the, what are the origins? How can I understand how I'm constrained by particular assumptions that frame my images of the future? Even if they're multiple and plural, they're within that still frame, the, the, the frame of, of, of a set of assumptions that, that people make in order to describe the future. Where do those come from? How can I become more able um, to understand how those limit me and also how those might enable me to uh, go beyond? Now, all of you will know uh, that this kind of a process where people reveal to themselves things they don't know much about um, and where also they try and come up with new ideas depends fundamentally on the relationships we have. So this is a relational process. It, it needs to be um, uh, founded in a process that allows for collective intelligence. Uh, by collective intelligence, I'm, I'm simply referring to the fact that um, all of us have tacit and explicit knowledge that we can share with others. Uh, and as we engage in that process, uh, it's a conversation, it's a, it's a discussion, um, we move from what's in our heads to what we're saying and we try to negotiate meaning we try to come to some common understanding uh, with those other people uh, and this is a way of also introducing diversity so not only does it anchor what's being said in people's tacit and it kind of invisible often um, assumptions and perceptions and images narrative structures um, but it also uh, exposes us to the uh, um, power of the future to invite people to share and negotiate what they're thinking about. And that was another one of the, 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 the really critical insights for me as a designer and practitioner, which was that the future is not your, your, your everyday topic. Uh, the future has a, a much stronger element of affect and emotion. Uh, and it motivates people, uh, and it reveals things. And in some senses, uh, this is why it's so crucial to follow very careful uh, design principles coming out of the theory of collective intelligence um, that relate to the fact that people are exposing themselves. They're exposing their values. They're sharing their hopes and their fears. But that then translates into something else, which became really critical from the point of view of designing processes that were able to reveal these assumptions and also allow people to scaffold, in other words, to acquire greater capability, um, which is that if we don't have an, a theory of anticipatory systems and processes, if we cannot distinguish the different kinds of futures, we end up with a lot of confusion. And I just want to point out, it's particularly relevant in this pandemic context, that um, <sighs> When different kinds of futures are mixed up because people are being asked to just think about the future as if it's only later than now, tomorrow, that's the future, which is, by the way, the default position of almost every exercise uh, and most work in the social sciences as well. The default position is the future is just later. Um, nobody really breaks it down into what is the future and how can I distinguish different futures and what's the relevance of distinguishing different futures. Once you do that, um, you begin to see that one of the reasons that the future becomes disempowering, and particularly in the dominant uh, perspectives that we know from uh, OECD and Western uh, ways of thinking about the future, uh, this, this becomes a, a, a kind of technocratic uh, uh, um, abdication, meaning, what happens is because the future ends up being confusing because you haven't distinguished desirable from probable, probable from open, uh, probabilistic, at risk from uncertainty, et cetera. Um, because those distinctions are not there and because the epistemic distinctions between duration and ephemerality are not made either, um, the future becomes you know, disturbing and perplexing. And because the future matters so much, because it's, it's such a crucial part of the structuring what we feel, what we see, what we do. Um, if it's confusing, people go, 
look, I need to find some guy with red hair who will tell me that the future can be uh, making America great again, uh, because I'm going to default to that. I can't handle it. Or people who just pick up, you know, one dystopian future or one uh, uh, utopian future. I've often used the, the example of uh, Marvel, Black Panther and Wakanda. Um, it becomes just so much easier, uh, but it also becomes easier to trust somebody who has a horoscope, by the way, and, div and divination. Meaning, if the future is something that's mysterious to us, then it's very difficult um, uh, to to take to take it on into our own thinking and, and to find ways to make use of this incredible power that we have, which is imagining the future. So, I, I think you, you get a sense of how, over time, uh, it became crucial for me to, as a designer and practitioner, to have underlying theoretical foundations. And those theoretical foundations, I think, provide us with a, a very powerful research agenda. Um, from, from, from as, as I've said to, to many people, uh, to me, the, the, the discipline of anticipation and future studies as the study of anticipatory systems and processes, not just the tools and the scenarios that are used in planning, um, is, is in its infancy. Uh, we're just at the beginning uh, of unpacking this. Uh, and it, it, there's nobody that you can ask, well, what, what are your anticipatory assumptions in order to categorize them in a particular uh, set of anticipatory assumptions? Because nobody knows what their anticipatory assumptions are. We haven't studied them enough. Mm -hmm. So this is a crucial part of the research agenda for this project. But I think it's also, and here uh, I want to uh, touch on the, the, the issue of the decolonizing um, aspect. I probably set out with, with a, a, a very strong personal desire to uh, find ways of attenuating what seemed to me to be uh, a colonizing view of the future, meaning the desire to impose today's views on the future. And I have to say it's probably from a skepticism, more than a skepticism, about the efforts in the 19th and 20th century to create societies. But it also, it also uh, it raises my hackles when you have the slogan of Silicon Valley, you know, which is the best way to, to predict the future is to create it. Well, that turns us into creators. Uh, what did you do on the seventh day? Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a way of looking at the world, which seems to me to be toxic. And it's toxic for many reasons. Um, uh, one of which is that it simply induces an incredible degree of anxiety because setting yourself up to feel secure because you've conquered tomorrow and you're going to control the future is, is obviously a way to be anxious <laughs> because you know it, it, the, the, the only certainty is uncertainty and therefore you're doomed. Um, so no wonder we, we have all this anxiety and also all this kind of default Somebody else is going to take care of the future. They're the god. They're the king. They're the emperor. Uh, they're anointed. Uh, they will take care of the future, and I'm just going to continue about my business. But the other aspect, I think, that, that of, of the decolonization that I that futures literacy and anticipatory systems reveals is the very fundamental role that the future has in our perceptions of the world around us. Uh, and here. Uh, 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 I don't want to claim any uh, generality or universality because there are many different ways that we become aware of our own perceptions. But the future is a, a massively powerful filter that uh, obscures certain aspects of the present because we're focused on, rightfully so, getting to the other side of the street and, and we're focusing on the cars that are coming along. Um, I'll end with this point. Uh, if we can think of the world around us as consisting of things that repeat, that have duration, and things that are different, that are new, um, one of the, 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 in some senses for me, metaphysical, meaning I have no justification for it other than it seems to me to be a good idea, um, and I can't really tell you why, uh, I'd prefer to understand the world than not understand the world. And that means being able to grasp difference. And the ability to grasp difference, I think, is often obscured by the images of the future that we have in our head, because we're using yesterday's dictionary. And let me finish on this point, because I think it's, it's one of the critical issues in front of us. The reproduction of oppression, the reproduction of racism, sexism, exploitation is in, I think, large part 
something that happens because the way we use the future makes us enemies of difference, a fearful of change. Um, and in, in effect, we try and improve the systems in the future, improve what we know from the past, but we do not take a open, potentially transformative through transition uh, perspective, which, which I've, I've tried to express, and I do so with some trepidation, but it's, it's to say the current way of using the future in many parts of the world, not all, uh, and there are many positive examples of other ways of using the future, but the dominant way of using the future uh, in the world today um, essentially uh, locks us in to the reproduction uh, of oppression. It creates a, 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 a context where, because we cannot appreciate difference, uh, we are unable uh, to live with difference. And furthermore, and this relates to another topic, but it's an important one. I think it, it, it puts uh, humanity in a position where we have a tendency, and this is quite universal, to build monuments and to be preoccupied with immortality and to, and to, and to over uh, valorize uh, duration uh, and, and, and things that last. And this is not a, a generous position towards the future. Uh, let, me, let me just summarize it and I'll end right there. Um, we have a very fundamental challenge, for instance, in what to do with the waste that comes from uh, using atomic energy uh, to create uh, power for, for electricity um, and obviously for weapons. Um, that's going to take 30, 40, 50,000 years to be dealt with. It's much longer than a pyramid uh, in Egypt uh, or the, the Great Wall in China or a pyramid in Mexico. Um, this is going to take a very, very long time. And we have to plan for that. But I think that the challenge before us today is to think about a humanity that will not create that kind of burden. In other words, we should never have created that waste because not only were we disrespecting the natural world in many ways, we were disrespecting our ourselves and future generations by burdening them with something that, that we had no right to do. And so rethinking in such a fundamental way is um, in my, uh, you know, one way of illustrating that is to say, you cannot reform slavery, you have to abolish it. And I must say that I think that the way we use the future now cannot really be reformed. We must abolish it. And that means not just, uh, you know, modifying the current paradigm, it means transforming the current paradigm. And I don't know and I can't predict what the transition strategies will be, but it seems to me that one of the fundamental uh, transition uh, initiatives is one like this uh, on the capacity to decolonize. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Riel. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, understand, understand uh, that you need to, uh, to demystify the future, uh, maybe to uh, uh, to create context in which you can appreciate uh, plurality. So this this might sound quite quite abstract uh, when we talk about uh, when you talk about disenchanting the future to play clear out confusions and so on. I, I hope that uh, the next uh, the, our next speaker, so Professor uh, Catherine Dora Hopas, uh, will, uh, will make it more. Well, maybe illustrate the case. Illustrate the case for uh, the capacity to decolonize uh, with uh, with, the, with an example. She will discuss with us uh, concerning the, uh, the the decolonization of, of education. So, uh, Auntie Catherine, are you ready? Are you around? I know you are around, but I haven't. I can see you here. And by the way, while we are waiting for, for Professor Odora Hopes, uh, let me just seek your consent again, please. So we will do that from time to time. So you know, you know, you know the words. So I say, Ahula, Ahula, or you see, Ahula, if you are still with us, if you are still ready, willing to, to, to engage. Ahula, Ahula. Ula, 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 ula. Super, ula. super, 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 so ula. nice, so nice, so nice, so nice. So, Auntie Catherine, ula. Auntie Catherine, the voice is yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Eva, can you do something? Eva? Yes. 
um, a comment. If philosophy of the future exists, it must be born outside of Europe or equally born in consequence of meetings and impacts between Europe and non-Europe. Because Europe has excluded so much and it is almost guilty of the past. So if the philosophy of the future exists, it must be born outside of Europe. Next. Hello, next. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I say this knowing that the European power, oh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 please go back. Hello, go back, please. Yeah, knowing that the European power of representation quickly lead the uh, it quickly lead to the European will to power in the post independence uh, period and after. Therefore, we must own our futures now. Hmm? on the one hand, and define the African space and identity in that future as we glow, go global. Next. Naya. This, I, I was, uh, I I was uh, engaged in South Africa in these uh, such chairs, the South African Research Chairs in this, uh, Initiative. And the chair uh, that I headed was called Development Education. Not education in development, but development education. That means that can development ever, ever be educated, really? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, the such chairs was funded by a parliamentary dispensation through the Department of Science and Technology in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Next. The objective of the such chairs was and is to be a strategic <laughs> knowledge and human resource intervention in the higher education sector. In the case of the Sachi Development Chair that I held for 10 years at the University of South Africa, I developed codes for transforming the disciplines, for example, law, economics, education, and science. Mm -hmm. Education envisage is with a capital E. Because education with a capital E is in higher education, lifelong and life word learning, eh? including what modernity, what uh, the Western modernity had excluded, hmm? is opposed to education with a small e is in the modern Western-based curriculum and syllabus, hmm, it is different because education with a capital E is transdisciplinary, while education with a small E is just focused on the tiny uh, notion of curriculum and syllabus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello. Eva. Can you see the innovation slide? Please. Mm -hmm. That brings us to uh, the word innovation itself. 
what do we mean really? What does innovation mean in a decolonized context, for example? It means that innovations has to go beyond formal laboratories into the informal sectors and systems, for example, indigenous knowledge systems using a completely different ethos. I say this because I worked in South Africa for over 24 years. And in this 24 years, I set the record to bringing a different ethos of practice and of thinking in the academy. Uh, I worked with the parliament and so on and so forth. And in the last 10 years, I worked with the National Innovations Foundations in India and the in Indian Institute of Management to, to let the, this concept of innovations be a reality. Mm -hmm. Next. Mm -hmm. We come to law. What does law in a decolonized context mean? It means going beyond the Western jurisprudence of retributive justice, which means that when you do something wrong, you are prosecuted until jail. Hmm? And expanding this notion to embrace jurisprudence of other cultures which respects nature and relationships, for example. That means that we, for, uh, in South Africa, we have to think about what does law mean when we follow Ubuntu, for example. It is not a joke. You, you, you don't just stir Ubuntu in the contemporary legal system and serve it uh, to the public. Ubuntu has got a very, very different metaphysics. So uh, we have to think about law in a different way. Uh, next. Eva, next please. Mm -hmm. Economics, what does e economics in a decolonized context means? It means going beyond the scarce city model, which has taken uh, us to hell and back, and hell and back several times, to unbounded ways of organizing. And, and I worked with the Seriti Institute and uh, unbounded organization academy in South Africa and the MBA in business administration in the University of Cape Town to experiment on this new approach to, 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 to operationalize, um, I mean, operationalizing economics because our future is too tied up with this narrow uh, sense of economic well-being. Next. So we come to science. What does science in a decolonized context mean? It means going beyond the supply side of the formula of science, for example. Uh, the science we know come from the practical applications of science and technology. But we have to think of the demand side of science. That means that we have to consider the philosophical base of science and uh, use that 
to create a new sense of building knowledge. Next. Okay. So what does knowledge in a decolonized context means? It means going beyond the Western dominated apartheid knowledge systems to actually plurality in, uh, of knowledges. Next. Hmm. In that sense, cognitive justice is a pillar because cognitive justice means the right of all traditional, uh, traditional and forms of knowledge to coexist in public without having a gun pointed at somebody's head, without duress. All forms of traditions of knowledge to coexist in public without duress. So uh, uh, I worked with, uh, with universities and institutions in Canada, Sweden, India, South Africa, and many more. Next. So when we come to the ways forward, we have to imagine several things. We have to imagine the setting up of a transdisciplinary fields in the in our region in our region here to tackle societal problems in a new way because a transdisciplinarity operationalizes knowledge uh, operationalizes plurality of knowledge and brings this together and and um, uh, 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 problems, uh, societal problems are tackled in a, in a different way. Now we are in this uh, seminar or this uh, meeting. I thank very much Real and uh, UNESCO because the future, the, the future's literacy envisages a, a capacity to be built, not just finger pointing, but a capacity, a human capacity to be built in anticipation of the very, very, very real possibility of decolonizing futures as a reality. Mm -hmm. A new form of decision-making and governance in science needs to be introduced. We need to move, move forward, I mean, move away from the compliance-driven ethics in governance to a lived ethics with a completely new epistemics and ecology driving it. So, our collective role is to make it a reality. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Auntie Catherine, uh, our Professor Odra Hoppers for us. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was great. It was great again, again listening to, to your ideas and, and how you, uh, how you, you actually uh, make uh, yeah, features literacy works every day, and and I want to show us how we can make it work every day in our own works. So, and so I will pass to the the the, the, the mic on to Fred Fred Garden. We uh, for and we are in the next ten minutes. We will and that 15 minutes actually we will have some uh, input about the practicalities of the project, the capacity uh, to decolonize. So first we will have Fred Karen discussing the, the implications for development support. And after Fred, Eva will uh, discuss or will share with us some ideas about the design of the program, the capacity to decolonize. So Fred, are you around? Thank you, Yannick. 
Thanks so much, Fred. Appreciate that. Um, so I'm an evaluator. I'm not a futures specialist of any kind. Um, and I've been involved in evaluation for about 30 years, much of that at the International Development Research Center, but more recently working on my own in research and evaluation and the development of methodologies and approaches for research and for evaluation. Um, and I should say that my, it, the approach of evaluation is changing for many people. It's no longer just about being external observers and objective uh, judges of society, but as many of the evaluators who are here today will tell you, it is also about being part of the transformation and change processes that need to take on, to be taken on in the world. So I see evaluation very much as part of change. Um, so that's just my own position. Um, a few years ago, one of my clients asked me as an aside, almost in a project, to tell them who's working on foresight studies in Africa, uh, a topic I knew very little about at that point. They're thinking about getting involved in doing some work. I came across this particular group. I came across Geshe at, uh, in South Africa and Riala Neva at UNESCO, among a small group of other future uh, studies and foresight uh, specialists in Africa, some of whom I see on, on the participant list. Um, and when I did that, uh, what, I, what really captured my imagination for evaluation is that in evaluation, we put a lot of, of thought into assumptions that people make when they develop their theory of change or their log frame or however they're designing their project. And we put some pressure on them around what are your actual assumptions behind that? And are they valid? Are they real assumptions? And often then we're asked to make recommendations for the future, but we don't actually have very much in our toolkit that focuses on how do we actually make fair and honest thinking about the future? How do we think about our anticipatory assumptions in ways that we can begin to unpack them and make recommendations and observations and suggestions that are more honest and that are more helpful to people? So that's our, um, that is what really captured me. Um, and we're, in evaluation, where I come from, we are interested in social change and social disruption because there are some serious problems and decolonization is one of the biggest challenges that I think we face today uh, in Africa, but also in many other parts of the world, including my own country here in Canada. Yeah, she told you a bit about what happened. The call for proposals came up. We got together, uh, didn't succeed, got some resources from IDRC to do some work and developed a, a project idea that Ava will go into some detail about in a couple of minutes. Um, and of course, we're, we're building monitoring evaluation and especially learning into that because there's a lot to be learned about uh, how we progress towards a much more decolonized world. Um, and thinking about moving beyond a, a colonial legacy to, to a decolonized perspective. And we have our own assumptions in that. And one of our assumptions is that working with local communities uh, is a really valuable part of that. And as part of that, we assume that local champions like Yannick, like Catherine, like Eva in the university sector uh, are important players and important leaders in that work, but that there are also elders, people who have deep knowledge not only of futures literacy, but also of, of Africa. And finally, that there is a, a role for allies, uh, people who are not African or based in African institutions, but beyond being empathetic, have some skills and knowledge and expertise to contribute to the journey. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Fred, for this so it's just sent, uh, presentation of the, the implication of the, of the C2, uh, C2D uh, from the development perspective. Thanks, thank you so much. Okay, Eva, are you ready? Uh, I am. So, okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, Eva, we're looking forward to, to your input about the, the, the program design and also uh, maybe the people behind the project by, by now. Thank you, Eva. Thanks for giving me the floor, Yannick. 
so basically the big question um, that I'm going to target is what is the capacity to decolonize as a program? You've heard different interventions. Uh, one that started around what future literacy was as a capability, the realization that our futures are often entrapped because we have not developed our imaginations in ways uh, that allows us to do so. And the, the relationship with colonization is obviously something that is important for us to stress upon. You've heard an intervention around decolonial theory and this quest for resurgence. Sometimes we use the term Ubuntu or the word freedom. It's basically, what are we here on this planet for? And then an intervention around evaluation. How do we follow through this process? How do we know that we've fulfilled our purpose? How do we know if we've achieved anything? Should we achieve anything in the first place? That's the question that remains uh, open-ending. You also heard another intervention around applied theory and this idea that obviously theory comes from the context, it's deeply rooted uh, from where it comes from. And then the question is, how do we ground it? And usually this question of how is associated with the who question. So who are we as a community? And basically the capacity to decolonize as a program is a community of praxis. Um, I use the word praxis and not only practice because here it's a community of people who are willing to allow learning to transform both their practice and who they are. You heard Fred just earlier talking about how we have a set uh, within this community of local champions, of allies, of elders, and also, of course, the delivery support team, all of which that I think were on the call, the two Freds, uh, together with Geshe and Miel and myself. In that sense, uh, this community um, is the very structure of the capacity to decolonize. This is an Africa-based project of three to five years, each year building on the other, around this idea of decolonizing around three ideas. Decolonizing being, decolonizing learning, decolonizing doing. So we have to get started uh, three case studies, uh, transforming governance, transforming development, transforming education. You've heard some of um, uh, the local champions, uh, for example, Professor Odora Hopes, uh, together with Yannick, who's facilitating us uh, smoothly through this process. We also have a series of projects in Mali and in Tanzania as well. The idea is to actually say that those questions speaks to many Africans, and there's, there's things to be learned from the continent to the rest of the world. So there's really this from Africa to the world perspective. So this community of like-minded folks, and by like-minded, we don't all think the same, but we are actually just this willingness to allow transformation to sink in and to actually look deep, deeply within, draw from two relationships with the world. Futures or the study of anticipatory systems and processes and decolonial theory. It comes from this understanding that basically futures are locus of power. There are spaces of inequalities. There are temporalities for hope. And by adopting a conscious understanding of why and how humans anticipate, we can take part in this redistribution of hope that is sought by human on their pathway to freedom, to resurgence, to Ubuntu. Now, what we've noticed, um, and I think you might have heard it um, through out the process, hearing from people that are more like future literacy practitioners and anticipation specialists, hearing from people that are more decolonial researchers, this fact that there's actually kind of like three sets of colonization that are observed in both fields. So both in future studies and um, in basically the production of knowledge worldwide um, that is targeted by decolonial theory. This idea that there's an intellectual forms of colonization that is reflected in our institutions, institutions of knowledge production. There's an instrumental uh, forms of colonization, colonization and there's also a political one so what we're trying to do throughout the project, sorry about that, what we're trying to do throughout the project is actually to see what's the connection, what's the entry point using those different uh, approaches and understanding that colonization is a reality. And what we see is that there are similar methodological implications. And basically there's one item that is structural, central. It's this notion of participatory action research using futures. The way we want to use action research is actually to negotiate the role of researchers. 
who is allowed to be a researcher and say that this is good knowledge or this is bad knowledge um, is actually something that we want to redistribute. So to create new power dynamics around this knowledge. And so we believe that we first need to start with an endogenous agenda, building on knowledges from all sorts. So not excluding, but acknowledging oppression and trying to raise awareness of knowledge coming from within. And this is what, what structures the C2D formula. The C2D formula, since we've been using three as our magic number, will continue. The C2D formula has three angles. It starts with setting a locally led and thematically led research agenda. The idea is that we're going to have like a series of community conversations with local champions and their community to understand what's at play. And I'll go back to it in a minute. The second angle is going through futures literacy capacity building. So understanding that there's a need for a capability based approach uh, to this search that we have, this resurgence that we seek. And a third angle that is structured around continuously defining what this capacity to decolonize is about. So we've been using this word all along uh, without completely defining it. We, we've defined where it was coming from, what's the disciplines that it belonged to, what's the approach to knowledge that it also fits in, what types of practice, uh, practices are actually reflected. Uh, in this approach, but it's true that this very capacity to decolonize that is building on uh, collective intelligence that is built on uh, humility and also the, the admission, the acknowledgement of our own limitations is something that we did not, we, we have yet to clearly define and it's been the core of decolonial works for the past a few decades, basically since the 20, uh, 20th century. In terms of C2D design principles, um, we hear a lot that are related to the fact that we apply what we call participatory action research. And participatory action research basically has three R's. Reciprocity, reflexivity, reflection. We admit that we have things to learn from one another. And because I'm ready to listen, the other person is also ready to listen to what I have to say. And so I can be actually ready to talk. And this um, request for consent that Yannick made earlier at the beginning of the call that is typical to any forms of Ubuntu pro processes, this idea of like consenting to, uh, to, to learn, consenting to be transformed by this relevant um, learning process is part of this reciprocity component. The reflexivity comes from this idea that we allow for feedback loops to actually nourish the process throughout. So this is co-design, this is collective intelligence. How can we accompany collective detection of change? This is all in all to nourish a reflection that is mixed with action. We understand that if our imaginaries were trapped, if somebody has defined our futures for us, or if our futures are meant to be looking like another person's past or present, then our agency has been limited. And so this idea of embracing something that goes through reciprocity, reflexivity, and reflection is actually another way to invite conversations around what agency would be about. So the capacity to, to decolonize is really structured around who initiates the inquiry. It's supposed to be indigenously led. So the local champions are really the key element. It's based on the interdisciplinarity and you've heard uh, Professor Dora Hopers talk about those different elements of how knowledge is not compartmentalized. Um, there's really this idea that there's connections between peoples, between knowledges, and between ideas that are always on the floor. And then it requires some kind of rigorous processes and a search for a pedagogy of hope and freedom that understand that learning as a process is more powerful than stocks of knowledges that are supposed to be there fixed um, and that somebody knows more than um, another person. So this idea of the capacity to decolonize is really a project that seeks to, uh, for many Africans, to repossess the archives of their own present, if I, you allow me to use the term coming from Kisukidi. In that sense, um, when we use action research, we try to tailor it to um, participants or co-researchers' expectations. We meet people where they act. And why is that important? It's because you've heard we have like many values and ideas that come from our 
contextual, cultural, political backgrounds. But that being said, how do we allow, uh, you know, how are we open to feedback? How do we um, hear what's in the room? And that comes with creating feedback loops that make it more natural, makes it inherent to the process. So we test out, we experiment, we seek consent. Last year, I guess she explained um, a little bit earlier how we had this co-design phase of the project uh, basically throughout 2020. And this is what allowed us to see that the strength of the capacity to decolonize as a program was its case-based nature. Um, and what C2D as a program had to add in terms of value was actually this process, this evaluation and the research that is associated with a capability-based approach. This ability to actually initiate those feedback loops between different local champions who use not to know one another. How do we connect Mali with Sierra Leone? How do we connect um, Tanzania with Namibia? It comes from understanding that the similarities in our context that are related to the struggles that we have, uh, but there's also opportunities in meeting one another. I'll just end on giving you an idea of what um, a C2D year actually looks like. Uh, basically, we start with community conversations with, local champion, with the local champion team. Uh, we ask eight research questions. Um, those eight research questions actually come from um, Tawaii uh, Smith, um, who has this idea of asking those eight questions. What research do we want done? Whom is it for? What difference will it make? Who will carry it out? How do we want the research done? How will we know that it's worthwhile? Who will own the research? And who will benefit? Starting from those eight research questions, we have an agenda that is slowly but surely being nourished. We add a capacity building uh, aspect to it with futures capacity that are built within the local champion community and identify partners within the community. And the idea is to use what we call futures literacy labs. So those different activities that enable people, people to become more futures literate. We use those labs to test out the hypothesis, to test out the agenda that, is, that was thought of by local champions in order to initiate a conversation, a consolidation that will be done by both the local champions and the community that they evolve in. Through the interactions uh, with different thinkers, with different doers from different spaces so within the community, with allies, with elders, with the delivery support team, with um, this larger um, community of practice in the making with the different local champions, we have this annual gathering um, which I will not dare um, uh, pronounce, uh, but I, I trust that uh, Geshe in the room will uh, slowly but surely guide me through with the legutla that we have as, um, as those annual meetings uh, to, to, to gather as a community. On the basis of this consolidation, we can then propose activities um, that would actually respect this agenda, understanding that the research uh, this action and this redefined agency that allows us to build a project together has been negotiated, has been created, has been challenged, and there's actually significant negotiation of meaning. So I'll pause here um, in order to open the floor for questions. Yannick, over to you. Cool. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eva, uh, for clarifying uh, for us what uh, the capacity to decolonize is as a project and the different stakeholders and, and also all the process uh, around the inclusivity and, and, and the reciprocity in the rent to, to the project. But thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, well, uh, I'm, already, I'm already seeing some questions in the in the chat. Um, I'm really, really, really looking forward to, to, to this part. So yes, the, before we start uh, with the questions, uh, please just allow me to seek your consent once again. So, Awula Awula. Awula. Awula Awula. Awula Awula. 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 Awula.
uh, maybe some of the, of the question rules need to be we don't have a specific orders and on, on, on in, in in those questions you so uh if you if you want just if someone want to share with us what the capacity decolonize mean for for her you can just do that and the same you uh, maybe you just want to share what resonates with you uh uh, uh based on the discussion we and uh, on the on the presentation we just we just had and yeah and also uh to our, our friends on the on the facebook live so please uh participate you can just post your questions um uh, as a comment and and we will we will, uh, we will uh, see uh, if the, if you can direct address someone from the panel someone one of the panelists so please uh, do feel free to participate even if you are following uh, through the facebook live okay so um uh just let me give me to one second to look at the chat so uh, i've seen some a, a discussion going on in the chat between uh Ciseco and and and, and rail uh I, I don't know maybe it's uh friend Ciseco kumaru around maybe you can just ask your question again in in the, uh for the audience so because uh, uh it seems that it was really uh you 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 and Ray was was having a, a, an interesting discussion that maybe we can, we might want to have life thanks for for that invitation yannick um and i'm going to keep my questions brief because i've got two of them <clears throat> one for rail and as well as one for ever um the first one of course was to say in many instances this radical proposition um that um rail was talking about in terms of sort of shifting our idea or conceptualization of what we mean by the notion of future. Do we suggest, how do we, how do we ensure sort of a transitory move as it were, right? So moving from the world as it is now to the world as, it, as we would like it to be. Yannick responds, of course, and then I respond with the suggestion that if we go back to Virgil, and I know Virgil was, you know, it's quite an old sort of poet writing in the sort of first century BC, but he suggests an interesting distinction between founding Rome anew and founding a new Rome, right? So there's this critical split. And my question here is to suggest maybe which one of these are we going for? Because that will determine how we sort of undertake the, I suppose, the selective processes that we use in terms of the methodologies, the kinds of questions we address and how we pursue those questions either in useful ways or the kinds of things that we then sort of abandon to ever. I, I'm interested in you talk about, and, and I'm also going to include Professor Dora Hoppus here in, in this idea of the inclusion of IKS. And I'm drawing from the work of Nakata Nakata Keech and Bolt when they write about indigeneity studies in, in Australia. And they suggest in many respects that we ought to be as critical of IKS or indigeneity or knowledge that emanates from our local communities as we are of Western knowledge. And I wonder uh, specifically to you, Eva, have we, have we been able to develop as it were, the kind of language, the lexicography that would allow us to be as critical of our own knowledge systems as we are presently of Western knowledge systems. And what does that entail in terms of defining that vocabulary for ourselves? And how does that necessarily assist us in terms of working very critically towards this work of decolonizing um, and specifically with the project that you guys are discussing here today? I'll stop there, colleagues. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Do you want me to dive in? Yannick? Oh yeah, 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 yes, 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 sure, please. Okay, um, so th thank you very much. But please, just, 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 just a quick comment. Just uh, in the since uh, I guess you all want to have a most as question as possible, so I will ask you and Eva, all the panelists, to try to be brief in the answers, please. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll keep it short. Um, thanks, thanks, Yannick. Um, let me say this: the, that that I'm very suspicious of. Um, the idea that, that we, we can know uh, whether or not we're actually renewing. Uh, because when it comes to the question of endogenous transformation versus exogenous change, um, I'm thinking of this from a systemic or from a, a, a refounding perspective, um, I don't think there's any way to know, actually. And I think one of the problems is wanting to know. Uh, that would be, to me, the ideological 
uh, strand of this thinking. So all I can say, and I'll, I'll say this is my experience, is that I know when something is strange. And I know particularly when it's strange to other people. Now, partly that could be because maybe, you know, maybe I'm strange or I say things in a strange way. Um, but oftentimes I think it's because it is strange. And if it is strange, I have a, a kind of benchmark. I have a kind of uh, way of saying, well, this looks like it's outside. This is disruptive. This is disturbing. Um, and, and, and to me, you know, that's, that's a fertilizer approach. I throw fertilizer onto the situation and I don't know exactly what's going to grow, but I'm trying to be nurturing. I'm trying to take a cultivating attitude. So that's, that's, I think, yeah. And I think the, the Frank Gilles stuff on, on, uh, on transition. I think one of the problems precisely with, with that is that it doesn't have a strong anticipatory systems component to it, which makes it difficult to understand what I would call the teleology. And I also think that this is a, a, a thing that we need to talk about from the point of view of Hannah Arendt, which is she left open what that meant. And I think that that was a, a huge degree of humility, uh, but very shocking, almost incomprehensible to a century where people really wanted to know what future they were creating, even if you were creating a different one, meaning I want a revolution. Uh, and my perspective is, is that you don't ever, you cannot make revolution. You can eventually experience that if it happens, but you cannot make it happen. Uh, you can be open, you can be nurturing, um, and you can experiment and there'll be many failures. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question, but, but that's kind of a, a, working, a working approach to the issue. Thanks for that, Eva. Uh, uh, Auntie Catherine. I feel like uh, the question is kind of also addressed to Auntie Catherine, because obviously indigenous knowledge system is really, has been a world for uh, more years than I can count. Um, maybe just um, on this issue of language, because I think language is actually a good connection between uh, futures and uh, decolonial thinking in the sense that there's this first realization that words are not enough to describe the words that we evolve in. And it's true that VL's influence in developing future literacy actually comes from complexity theory and this understanding that the world has more to tell us than what we usually um, take it for. Um, and so what's interesting about uh, embracing participatory action research about having the humility not to come as, you know, the experts of the future or the experts of um, uh, even like knowledge or education is actually uh, sitting down and listening to what people have to say. Uh, but what's important from a designer perspective is how do we design spaces where people actually feel comfortable enough to actually share what's on, on, on their minds and then to start and negotiate uh, on the basis of this conversation. Because to create anything new, we first need to know what's there. Uh, so that might be like one of my answer to your question, but obviously it's a limited one. And, and Catherine, please, uh, Auntie Catherine, please. <laughs> I've got two um, uh, inputs to make. Um, uh, in, uh, in 2012, we wrote a book called Rethinking Thinking. Modernities other and the transformation of the universities. In that book, it is only 90 pages or something like that. But in that book, there was a, a, a chapter called Transformation by Enlargement. That means that we are not rejecting modernity as such, but we want to include others that our old paradigm locked out. So if we, 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 we take this approach, it means that the universities and the Western institutions that we are all part of, should we should prepare ourselves to embrace others, even in their so-called poverty, or uh, with, uh, even without them having shoes. Because um, you cannot 
dialogue with somebody from a position of arrogance. We are all, in fact, all of us educated people, we are so filled with arrogance. You know, we have to be very careful how we go to the communities because our arrogance shows eh, from the road there, hmm? I'm going to the community. <laughs> eh? Going to the communities must mean you, you have to accept humility and so on, so that, <clears throat> so that you can go to the communities to actually listen actually listen with your guts, not with your ears, eh? stuck to this arrogant brain of yours. So uh, that is the two uh, inputs I, uh, I wanted to make because you cannot say, uh, how, uh, how can you uh, critique the Western knowledge systems and yet you fail to critique indigenous knowledge system. That is right, because uh, we have to create a, a space for dialogue in the first place. You mm -hmm. cannot say, oh, uh, you don't, don't could, uh, critique the Western knowledge systems, and yet you are, taking, uh, you are stepping on indigenous knowledge systems neck. OK, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for, for, for those comments to the panelists. I see another question in the chat uh, which, has, which has been, been addressed uh, by uh, Margaret. Uh, Margaret, are you around? Is Margaret still around? Yes, I'm still here. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Uh, maybe can, can you please just uh, share the question? Uh, I mean, do you want to address the question to someone specific in the panel? or? Uh, it's just a, it's just a, a general question to, to to the group. I think it's just a general comment okay. and uh, to see what comes out of it. Um, okay, cool, cool. Thanks I guess so much. I was just I was reminded of um, Chimamanda and Gozi uh "Danger of the Single Story," um, and her example of you know comparing apples with mangoes and what was more relatable or relevant to the context in which these stories were being told. Um, and I was just wondering what that could look like for um, African futures literacy or developing um, African methods towards understanding the future or developing strategies. Um, so the example I gave in the, the comments was about um, a, a friend who grew up in a township in the Eastern Cape in South Africa. Um, and when he was little, he would wait for the sun to rise when you know the sky is a little bit red and it's a bit difficult to see. And he would wait until he saw this uh, swarm of bees. So like little dots on the horizon that he would then follow to the flowers and then to the honey. Um, so I just thought it was an interesting story of how kids at this age were already thinking about strategies and looking for those little signals. Um, and just it reminded me of, of some of the strategies we use in our, uh, you know, our use of, of futures tools and techniques. And what is it that, you know, Africa could contribute or uh, is there a different way of, of looking at futures from, from our lens? Mm. Thank you so much for the comment, uh, Margaret. Uh, Eva, uh, I've seen you nodding, uh, nodding while, uh, while Margaret was was uh, sharing the comment. Do you do you want to do you want to address that? Uh, do you have do you have anything to add on it? I'm sure you have something to add on it. <laughs> I have to say that I was bribed by the moderator to mm -hmm. say that uh, the simple answer to Margaret's question was just to look at what Kabakos was doing in Mali. So I'm putting it there. <laughs> Now, just on 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 your on your question, Margaret, I think there's um, an important element that is also related to the provocation of the title of the project. The project is called the capacity to decolonize. Bear in mind that um, we're also very much aware that we're not very sure what this capacity is about. Um, and um, this provocation, for me, is also a way to say that decolonization is not singular. Uh, is not there's not just one answer or one way to decolonize. And I, I read a question in the chat, I think from Eva Maria, 
uh, talking about how there's different moving stories around decolonization, and that's very true. There's basically this idea that, um, and that's what we want to test out with having different case studies in different parts of Africa. Even within one country, it does not mean the same thing. Um, actually, uh, Yannick and, and, and myself, we both come from Cameroon, but we've been out interacting with a lot of uh, critiques coming from Southern Africa, where the word decolon decolonizing is used, especially in the academic and university circumstances, in ways they're not, uh, for example, in Cameroon. Does it mean that we're not addressing those issues? I would tend to say that this we, we are also addressing those issues. We're not using the same terms. We're not using the same imaginaries. For example, this notion of the politics of the imagination that come from Ashil Bembe, who's also from Cameroon, even though he's based in South Africa, uh, this notion of looking for an Afrotopos, looking for other spaces for our imagination, not only think about development as steps, but also think about development that starts some um, that start in our heads first. Uh, and that comes from Senegal. So there's a need also for all of us to uh, connect um, those different ways about thinking, uh, thinking the world. And the good thing about future is, as we all said earlier, the future does not exist. So it's actually a good way for us to actually uh, connect with those, um, to have the space for a conversation to be had. In the meantime, um, when you talk about having African, like specific African tools, um, we might want to try to avoid falling into the into essentializing trap of like thinking that there's one way that is the African way of doing futures. That said, we also acknowledge the fact that um, Africa as a continent, Africa as a, as a series of space and uh, African histories of ways to actually open up conversation with the rest of the world and actually say, oh, listen up. If we represent this community of the oppressed, there's actually things that we can share with both the oppressor and the oppressed. And this connection, this syncretic connection is something that we're trying to grow from. It looks like Geshe wants to come yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, thanks so much, Geshe. Uh, before is before Geshe jump in, uh, I, I just saw a question for uh, Auntie Catherine in the chat by Evan. So, uh, Auntie Catherine, did you see the question? It's a question specifically for you. Um, he, he was asking me if uh, I know of any schools of education or something like that, uh, which are following uh, this uh, future's written literacy. You know? But, uh, you know, at the moment, we are all, uh, we are, we are swallowed, hook, line, and sinker. This hate system, really. We have to uh, to exercise our minds hmm? because uh, 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 at the beginning of my speech, I I this presence uh, I do I do the difference between education with a capital P and education with the with with the small uh, P, uh, um, E. We are all buried hook, line, and sinker with, with the education with a small e. We think that it is everything. And uh, we are all mistaken, really. Huh? Also, so there is, there is no school of education anywhere, actually, huh? that, had, had, uh, that has uh, overcome and transcended eh, the, the yoke of uh, Western education. Thank you, thank you so much for for uh, for, for this comment. So yeah, uh, and if I'm just having a, a look at uh, on the chat. So I guess the we we address a couple of comments in the chat, but still some which want to address. For example, I see a comment by Lauren about uh, yeah, how do we design the conversations and how do we ensure that the design of the conversations is not grounded in colonial, in colonial epistemologies. So, uh, Lauren, uh, if you are still around, please, can you 
Uh, do you want someone on the panel to address this question? Was it? Do you have someone in mind on the panel? Did you, from you, you, you want to have a comment on the question? Uh, I mean, I've really enjoyed hearing from Auntie Catherine or <laughs> Professor, <laughs> Professor. Uh, and I would, I would just love to hear her thoughts on that. And, and really anyone, yeah. if anyone has yeah, any yeah, response yeah. to it. Yes, uh, maybe, uh, I mean, Geshi, maybe that's, Geshi, are you around? Maybe that's, that's I guess that's, that's gonna be, a, 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 I, would, I would love to, to have your, your say on this. <laughs> no, actually, I think it would be great for Auntie Catherine to respond on that. <laughs> and mine was, I was gonna add on to Eva's earlier, but I'm happy <laughs> to wait and I think there's some hands up, so no problem. Okay, so, so I, uh, well, then after for first Auntie Catherine and then you, I would probably, you, 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 you sure have something to, to contribute on this, I'm sure. Can you repeat the question for me, please? Lauren, please. Re repeat the question. I, thank you. Yes, so I was saying, uh, how do we design those conversations? You were talking about designing the conversation, I said. And, and also, how do we ensure that the design of the conversation is not grounded in those epistemologies? So I teach designers and I find it so hard because a lot of, a lot of the work we do is about maintaining and continuing oppression that we don't even realize we're part of. You're right. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't function if you, you, you design something. The design is action in itself because if you have to, 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 to invite people, for a dialogue, you cannot design a dialogue. You, you cannot, because you have to be free eh, of your own mindset. And you have to invite people to a, a safe place and you cannot design a safe space. You have to go into it and um, uh, that space will create its own design. That's okay. wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks. Geshe, some, anything to add? Uh, uh, yeah, so sorry, and this maybe takes us a step back, but maybe reflects yeah. a bit on this as well. Yeah. I, I, think, I think the issue uh, that was being discussed just now of process is quite important because I find at least in my own practice, and, and these are things I'm learning in the course of CTD as well, um, sometimes the issue is not so much the epistemologies that are on the table. It's the desire or commitment to excluding others that's more problematic. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I'm involved in an international project, just to give this as an example, where, um, and, and Riel used the language earlier about where you realize that you're locked into uh, a system that can only reproduce what it's doing because it insists on using the same tools, it insists on using the same language, it insists on using the same framework while trying to do something different. And then it wonders why it can't. Um, and so, so, you know, part of this international project with really brilliant people, uh, and then immediately realizing that we begin as most projects do, including C2D with a background paper. So this is the paper we're going to use and these are, are the frameworks. And there's nothing wrong with that until you get to the design stage and everybody says, we are now going to essentially cobble together from what we've got on the table. We're not going to extend beyond this. We acknowledge that this is limited, but we refuse because it's too difficult, because we don't know how, because it would be messy and we've got a six month project, uh, because the experts at the table can only do one, two, three, and therefore we can't venture into four, five, six. Because the thing you're mentioning you're raising a question and you don't have an answer to it. Therefore, we're not going to entertain that question because you are unable to answer it yourself. I think those, those kinds of tendencies, and I see Lorraine nodding, so I guess you've seen this. <laughs> uh, I, I think for me are the bigger issues. So in fact, sometimes I find in my own practice, I'm less concerned with whether, I mean, you can, you can use a Western theory, you can use you know, some, some way of doing that exists. But I think the refusal to extend beyond that uh, I think is what becomes really dangerous and problematic. And so when uh, in the course of C2D, when we have learned a lot about words like generosity and humility, 
uh, I think those become very important. And so I think in, I think it's, it's something about the way of doing things that also matters. Uh, so it's not just the concepts and, and, and whether there's something wrong with Western thought. To me, that's not the primary. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gitche. Uh, thank you so much, Auntie Catherine, for agreeing uh, Lauren's comment. Uh, yeah, we have a question from the from the Facebook Live from Jimmy Jimmy Hammond. Uh, uh, the question is, how do we know we know? Does it resonate with the capacity to decolonize process? So, how do we know we know? Does it resonate with the capacity to, to decolonize process? Okay, so um, I guess that's actually a question that even anyone in the panel could address. And, but if I do that, then we will, will need like one one hour more. <laughs> so, 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 uh, I don't know. We, I, 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 we want to we want to take the question. So, Rel, Gishi, Eva, Antis, I don't know. So, uh, or maybe even Fred, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yannick, can I say, and I think it, it, it relates to the design issues that have been raised yeah. so far. Is yes. That, is that one of the ways that you know, and it's uh, a testimony to the uh, how can I say that the the inadequacy of uh, so much of our our the, the reductionism that has that has crippled our epistemic capabilities mm -hmm. um, is is that you know that you're on a broader wavelength that you have the passion the emotion you have mystery you have all sorts of things that enter in to the design into the actual activity where people are transcending themselves. Uh, from wherever they started. And I think that this is one of the crucial things for me is, is everybody must start from where they are, not from some other place. And it's with respect to how they feel they've moved, uh, and which is not going to be the same, that we know that it's something is happening. Um, we don't always know what, but at least we have, uh, as, as Eva talked about before, the, 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 the sense that we are tapping into some degree of authenticity uh, that's not truth. That's that's the sense that you are genuine to yourself. Um, and I think that that uh, there again, we have a lot of uh, advantages in the way futures literacy um, becomes incorporated into people's thinking is that they they are invited to unpack their own perspective and to share it with others. And as a result, you have you have this kind of, uh, uh, I mean, you're, you're challenged by the inadequacy of the way we do it now in many ways. Um, and therefore you, you are obliged to transcend if you are in a trusting uh, uh, context where the, where the tools, the heuristics, the games, um, and again, I'll, I'll talk uh, about my, my, my brother Kamara, uh, he, he, he uses a libation to start his futures literacy labs. And I think it's, it's a brilliant example of how you can use the past and you can also use references um, that, that, in, that invite people to go beyond. And it's that, it's that transcendence which allows you to kind of know that something's working. So I, I don't know if that makes sense to people, but I'll stop there. Cool. Thank, thank, thank you so much for, for the comment. So Jimmy, I hope you, uh, the question was addressed. Um, so uh, actually, I would like to give to to give the the opportunity to another, to another panelist to 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 address the question. But we have we have three more questions in the chat. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so that's really really nice. So, um, uh, yes, I guess the next question in the chat is uh, for Eva and Auntie Catherine. Eva, did did you see the question uh, about? Uh, uh, the, 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 the role of features literacy or the capacity to decolonize in the context of culture. I did, I believe that once again for uh, Auntie Catherine, uh, yeah. I would like to, to react to this notion of culture. Just for future scenarios, it's true that we did not explain like the methodology of um, the different futures activities that we organize for literacy activities. Um, the one that is the most sophisticated uh, tool uh, that has been um, initiated by Riel and then developed by this community of practitioners is called the Future Literacy Lab. And throughout these processes, where we first like dive into probable futures, preferred futures, reframed futures, and we then ask ourselves new questions coming from these experimentations of different futures uh, before sitting down and thinking about our own sense of agency and what we can do as a community. Okay. 
this is usually how we proceed with, uh, with, uh, with an FLM. And so when it comes to exploring this notion of culture, uh, what has been important for us is actually to make sure that this remains relevant in all contexts. Um, I'll give two examples. Um, on the lab that I organized in Libreville, so in the cap capital city of Gabon, uh, what I decided to do for the reframing scenario was actually to tell a story that was coming from Punu communities in the southern part of Gabon, uh, which was a way for me to invite the conversation using imaginaries that were already at play and were reflective of some of the anticipatory assumptions that I had, to, that I had heard um, in probable and preferred futures. Uh, another way of doing that is, for example, for a lab that I was organizing in um, in, in Lebanon, uh, I was using um, Badgamon because this is a game that is often used in the region. So there's ways to actually make sure that we can hear context and that also is related to co-design. If within the co-design team you have uh, futures literacy practitioners, but also um, the local champion team who comes with their own expectations, who tells you exactly you know where they're at when it comes to futures it's easier for you to build that thanks thank you so much eva so i guess we have uh, we have a couple of questions left and i will really want us to address at least two more questions so and uh, tomato had had a question uh, uh tomato are you still around yes uh, yes thank you so yes. much for for for, for being ready to, to, to share your question, your comments with us. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, uh, mine is uh, it's a comment. Uh, you know, uh, the, I want to start off by quoting um, Steve Vico, you know, because uh, Steve Vico, I believe that he was conscious of uh, what was happening uh, then when he said uh, uh, emancipate yourself from mental slavery none but ourselves can free our minds i mean the first speaker uh, spoke about uh, imagination uh, which you can imagine uh, your your future and, and your past so what, what i'm what i'm saying is that uh, even the the past uh, People here have been uh, talking about it. Uh, you know, uh, before you can colonize, you can decolonize uh, Africans. I think you must first uh, teach them about their history. Uh, I, I'm talking about uh, before uh, people like uh, Christopher Columbus uh, came to Africa in uh, 18 something. Uh, that history will uh, will will have a para paradigm shift in our African people. They will know that they were uh, kings and queens here in Africa. They were uh, really leading in uh, development in Africa. Things were happening because we we had resources. So uh, I I really want to say that if we can know where we come from, we will know that uh, where we where we are going to. We are going uh, in future, and a lot of things like uh, we just had a an African uh, trade, uh, uh, African continental trade. So in that we in the value chain, it's not a lot of people, uh, African people that are uh, supplying there. So we are we are not manufacturing because we don't know basically who we are. So if we, if we can we can know who we are, we will definitely know where we are going. No, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is again a, a great comment to to underscore the, 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 the relevance of building a capacity to decolonize. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, we had another question from Marcus. Uh, Marcus, are you around place? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to find the question again in the chat. Yes. Uh, Marcus, are we around? Okay. Yes, thanks yeah. so much. Thanks yeah. so much. Um, the, it's a wonderful discussion. And the question I had is about um, 
the approach to issues of power, whether these powers are epistemic, whether they are physical violence or financial. And I'm thinking especially about entrenched powers that are hindrances to decolonization. How can they be overcome? How can they be ignored? How can one adapt to them? What kind of typologies or strategic maps uh, would you recommend that can assist in dealing with such issues of power? Thank you so much. For, thank you so much for, for, for the question, Marcus. The issue of power, of course. Power. And uh, yes, we want to, to take the question. Just a really quick one on this, Yannick. Yes, yes. Um, I, I think one of the things to do at a very practical level. Um, and I speak here as a designer and, and you know implementer is is truth in packaging, um, and I think that there are times when uh, certain people don't want to challenge. They don't want something that's subversive. They don't want something that will uh, allow people to take uh, have perspective uh, uh, that futures literacy involves. In which case, you don't do it. But there's another also very. Uh, uh, tricky issue, which has to do with the actual people who participate in processes where we reveal anticipatory assumptions, which is not everybody wants to do that uh, uh, for many reasons. Um, so again, there are definitely limitations just uh, at a very basic methodological level uh, that have to do with, you know, I'll take the very banal example. If you invite people into a, a, a process where they're going to expose their values because they're going to talk about their idea of the future uh, and there's somebody who has power over them in the group that's going to make it very difficult for them um, so there's some very real it's, it's an important issue at all levels so thanks for that yeah i wanted to just add that uh catherine raised the importance of humility in these processes and you have to have the humility to want to to change and to want to learn and power and humility do not go together so you ultimately end up where Riel did, which is you don't do it with people. You think about this as building something else while other things are, are weakening because of the new strengths. Thank, thanks, so, thank, thanks, Fred. Yeah, yeah Auntie, go, go ahead, please. But please, 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 please try to be brief as we as we should close. Yeah, thank you. I've dealt with power. I'm not afraid of it. Actually, I'm not afraid. Yeah? <laughs> the, um, my clue to dismantling power is that you have to know what power is standing on. And then you can dismantle it bit by bit. I'm not scared of power. Thank you so much for, we are not scared. I mean, I will say we are not scared by power. Good, great. So, um, yes, uh, thank you so much for, for the comments. It was just, it was so, so, such a nice audience. And as, just, as I just put in the chat, uh, even if we debrief the, our, our, our session now, uh, please keep sending questions and comments in the chat if you have some, so because uh, the team will certainly come back to you if you send any questions and uh, even if we were not able to address your question in this discussion. Uh, yes, the, uh, yeah, we have four minutes left to uh, to close our session, to close this really, really amazing session. I really enjoy it. Uh, and that, that, I mean, the, there is quite, uh, there's quite a lot of really, quite a lot of uh, 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 really uh, powerful and, and, and a thoughtful uh, point like uh, redistribution, it's, it's about the redistribution of hope, it's about going from Africa to the world, uh, it's about clearing out confusion, uh, the coordinality is real, it's about building resilience and so on. So. Um, uh, maybe I will. You know, I will give a. This was not planned, as you know. We believe in emergence, so it was really not planned. So I will give the floor to the panelists and ask you really, like in less than one minute, to to wrap up the discussion for you. In less than one minute, really. So really, something like thirty seconds. So you don't have more than one or two sentences. Like, 
or, or a short sentence is right because no sentence sentence can go for one hour. So, so go ahead, less than one minute to wrap up uh, our discussion. Thank you. So we start. We can just start with Deshi and then Real and so on. So the order, the, the appearing orders. Okay. So me first. Yes. Yes. Okay. Gish. So yeah, I think just feeling very grateful and also for the expanding yeah. that everybody is doing in terms of the questions. So thank you for that. Uh, thanks so much, Gishi. Thank you so much. Yeah, grateful, gratefulness. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yes. My, my appeal, as as is often the case, is when we have opportunities to collaborate, don't hesitate to look to create them. Uh, so my hope is that this is a conversation that uh, spreads many invitations to collaboration and to turning these ideas into practical experiences for all of us on the ground, wherever you happen to be. So that's that's my, my hope. Thank, thank you so much. I hope, uh, hope about uh, collaboration on the ground uh, and, and extending the work. So thank you so much, Ray. Uh, on to catch me. What I'm going to say is that you should know yourself first. Yes. And then you can go forth yeah. to save others. Hmm? And know, know yourself. Know yourself. Know yourself. Sure. Thank you so much. Fred. Thanks, Yannick. I'm just grateful for uh, all of the participation and engagement, and I'm really delighted at the range of the participants, both in terms of fields and geographies. It's, uh, it's been a wonderful exchange. Thank you. Mm, thank you so much for this really great comments, Fred. Thank you so much. Eva? Yes, thanks for that. Um, I would say I would end on what this program means to me. For me, this is really a space, a playground for meaningful conversations, such as the one we're currently having, to happen. Um, and also a good way for people to realize that, you know, the future is not a luxury, it's actually something that belongs to all of us. Um, yes. And so if that is something that you got at of this seminar, then uh, I believe that will fulfill part of our purpose and do not uh, hesitate to reach out. Good, thank you so much. Yeah, and to close this, I will just uh, repeat what Eva just said. Please, please we'll reach out if you have any ideas, any comments, if you want to be part of it, this, if you, if you want to just, if you, just want, if you just want to engage to continue discussion, please reach out uh, via the website. Um, the website was, was shared in the chat a while ago. Eva, please could you just share the website again in the, in the chat? Uh, yes, and again, uh, yes, uh, I'm really, really grateful to be part of this. Thank you so much for, um, for, for, for sharing this space with us again. And yes, and just let's make sure that we, we, are, we, are, we are on the, on the same line again by uh, uh, sharing our willingness to engage in the future again. Awula, awula. Awula. Awula, awula. Okay, thanks so much again. Thanks so much, please. Stay safe, stay healthy. And yes, I'm looking forward to engage with, uh, with any one of you soon. Thank you.